So um, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's webinar, which is jointly organized by the Tallinn University of Technology in Estonia and the Institute of International and European Affairs in Ireland. I am Andrew Roberts. I'm a cybersecurity specialist at the Tallinn University of Technology, and I will be uh, chairing today's event. So this webinar is part of the project Europe's Digital Future, uh, which is coordinated by the Institute of International and European Affairs in Ireland. As part of this project, the IIEA has established a network of think tanks and academic institutions to share research and perspectives on Europe's digital future from across Northern Europe. To learn more about the project and to see the earlier events and publications in the series, uh, you can visit uh, www.iiea.com. Uh, we're delighted to be joined today by a diverse panel of experts from across Europe who have been generous enough to take time out of their schedule to speak to us and address the question, how can the EU engage in the information space in times of crisis? Each panelist will speak for approximately 10 minutes today. We will then have a discussion with the speakers and questions from the audience. You will be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen. Please feel free to send your questions in throughout the session as they occur to you, and we will come to them once the speakers have finished their presentations. A reminder that today's presentation and uh, question and answer session are both on the record. Uh, so please feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handles at CyberTelTech and at IIEA. So uh, to give you an introduction to some of the speakers that we'll be uh, enjoying today, um, we have Seem uh, Kumpas, a policy officer at the East Stratcom Task Force of the European External Action Service. Uh, we have Oberstleutnant uh, Dr. Zonka Niederinghaus uh, from NATO Stratcom Center of Excellence. Uh, we have Marcus Holmgren, a research fellow at the Finnish Institute of International Affairs. Dr. Adrian Venables, a senior researcher at the Center for Digital Forensics and Cybersecurity at Tallinn University of Technology, and Dominika Jantats, an information security analyst at Eurofins. So the first presentation will be made by Seem Kumpas. So uh, Seem serves as a policy officer at the East Stratcom Task Force of the European External Action Service, focusing on the EU's work against pro-Kremlin disinformation and foreign information manipulation more broadly. Uh, before joining the EEAS, he held a similar portfolio at the Strategic Communication Department of the Government Office of Estonia from 2018 to 2021. Uh, Seem worked for the Ministry of the Interior from 2015 to 2018. Seem holds a, a Master of Arts in Communication Management from the University of Tartu. And today's presentation, uh, Seem will be providing will be providing a wider EU perspective on this issue. So I now hand it over to Seem. Hi, and thank you for the great introduction, Andrew. Uh, I hope you can hear me loud and clear. I will. Uh, shoot up my slides in a second. Uh, gratefully, if you can confirm whether you can see them, and then I'm off. You can see uh, see the slides. Yes, we can see the slides, but you might want to enter presentation yes. mode. Yes, perfect. Uh, so, hi everyone. Uh, I said my name is Sim, and I work for the. European External Action Service, which in short is the foreign arm of the EU. Um, today I'm going to use the 10 minutes to frame a bit our thinking uh, when it comes to um, countering foreign information manipulation and interference and bring a couple of examples of the work we've done uh, throughout uh, Russia's war in Ukraine at the moment. Um, for us, uh, we, for, for quite some years, uh, we worked around the definition and, and the kind of the idea of disinformation, which still is very much in use and, and broadly shared, uh, but uh, we've moved a bit past that uh, to something we call uh, foreign information manipulation and interference. It's a bit of a mouthful, but uh, let me quickly explain why. So um, first, disinformation uh, is in our eyes just one part of the big problem. It's, you know, a piece of information that is knowingly misleading or, or factually wrong. 
but let's take uh, kind of a, another classical example, a network of bot accounts or, or fake accounts or, uh, or a kind of a coordinated activity around uh, some kind of information that is not disinformation per se, but that can and is being used to manipulate with information. So hence our kind of thinking uh, rather in terms of information manipulation more broadly. We added the foreign because I said we are the foreign arm of the EU, meaning our mandate is to look at the external threats uh, targeting the EU and our uh, immediate neighborhoods. And uh, the interference part in the end comes from the fact that uh, when we've started looking at what China is doing, uh, their arsenal is much broader. So they also, for example, suppress independent voices, use censorship and and other types of techniques that maybe wouldn't wouldn't necessarily fall uh under information manipulation oh my lights just went out but i hope you can still see me um uh, so so hence hence the interference in the end and how are we working to to kind of tackle that uh so we conceptually we're working on something called the kind of the Femi toolbox and uh, while still in the making what it would include are four big elements. First, situational awareness. So the kind of bread and butter. Uh, this includes monitoring media, analyzing media, including social media. This would include uh, social uh, research, uh, public opinion polling, all different types of research that is relevant in terms of us understanding what is happening in, in the information environment. Secondly, building on that knowledge we've accumulated, it's actually uh, building resilience. Uh, this would include many, many things from uh, raising threat level awareness to uh, running uh, public awareness campaigns to raising media and information literacy uh, to to many, many other other things. Um, thirdly, it's for us, it's about disruption and regulatory responses. Uh, and uh, there are steps that the EU is taking at the moment, be it the Digital Services Act, the Code of Practice on this, this information, uh, for example. Um, and lastly, um, again, being a foreign service, uh, we have a set of diplomatic responses that we can deploy. Uh, everything from demarches, uh, political statements, to up to sanctions and, uh, and other types of uh, measures. Um, if I'm coming to the resilience building part, which for us would also include awareness raising and communication, which is the topic of, of today's discussion, uh, the war in Ukraine for us meant firstly a huge increase of output uh, of different communications products, uh, be it uh, campaigns, full on campaigns, be it uh, uh, some smaller uh, fact checking initiatives, debunks, uh, uh, what have you. And for us, uh, we have a couple of ways to do it. So we have our very official um, EAS channels, uh, main ones of the HQ, and also we have a huge diplomatic network across the world. Uh, which we have uh, heavily relied on uh, in this uh, in this war to push out their message in different languages and in kind of different nuances to really have them reach audiences on the ground uh, in in areas like Africa, Latin America, Asia Pacific, and and so on. Um, and also, what what is probably uh, I would say kind of a a strength of ours is we have something called EU versus Disinfo, which is one of our projects uh, up and running since 2015. It is very publicly affiliated with the EU, but it's not the official voice of the EU. So we have the kind of the strength of, of the project uh, having um, having some 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 shared legitimacy with, with the EU, but at the same time, uh, we, we're not necessarily constrained by what uh, what the official positions are, meaning we can be much bolder, much faster, much more nimble uh, in our communications uh, than uh, our kind of main uh, communication channels as the EAS. Uh, we also started uh, putting out much more material in uh, Ukrainian, but also Russian, reaching out to audiences uh, speaking Russian in different, different countries and regions. Mm, as said, we have relied heavily on our network of uh, delegations, which really covers uh, most of the world and uh, is a big asset for us. And we have uh, explored a number of new channels that were uh, previously off the table for official EU uh, purposes, uh, be it Telegram, be it Fontokia, for example. And just to bring a couple of examples and then 
I'm happy to have, pass on the mic to the next speaker. As said, uh, EU versus disinfo is one of the reasons it's it's great to have as as an outreach channel for us is the fact that as said it's a project run by the EU, but it's not reflecting EU's uh, EU's uh, official policies and uh, kind of uh, lines to take only. Meaning, as I said, we can be much bolder. So uh, what we've done uh, over the course of the war, among other things, is uh, quite a lot of fact-checking. And there we can be pretty blunt because Russia is really, you know, they're really making it easy for us when we just take the things they they say, uh, their officials, high-ranking officials, spokespersons say, we show the reality on the ground. The the difference is just so great that it, it really speaks for itself. Also, uh, maybe a bit of a problematic trend that we've picked up over the past, I would say, couple of months is uh, uh, pro Kremlin sources using kind of fake fact checking. Um, as a way to push their narratives. So they have kind of hijacked a bit the idea of fact-checking and put it into malicious use, uh, which is problematic first because it's sending out uh, a kind of a disinforming narrative. Secondly, it's I think eroding the whole idea of, of fact-checking as a reliable way to kind of uh, make the information sphere a better 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 place if you will um and what we've done with that is we've uh, a couple of times just taken so the, the image on the right you can see it's uh, everything in in black is what what uh, russia put out via their diplomatic uh, uh, networks uh, everything you can see on the with reds the, this is kind of our correction of it so something very quick and dirty that we put together in an hour, and that included the validation process, uh, put it out there, and in a matter of, uh, we did it, I think on Friday, by Monday, it had uh, uh, picked up uh, almost a quarter million views, which is really, in in, in our terms, I would say, uh, a really, really wide, wide reach. Uh, even some some bigger campaigns that we've, you know, worked for much harder, uh, don't reach these numbers very often. And two last examples, and then I'm then I'm off uh, for the time being. Um, uh, I mentioned campaigns earlier, so one of the ways to uh, balance out the information environment is is obviously by by running uh, awareness campaigns. We've done a couple uh, throughout the war. Uh, one of them uh, tried to bring together uh, artists, um, and and then. Kind of show the first the effect of war on cultural heritage in Ukraine, and then secondly the other way around show uh, the role of artists and and their kind of efforts to uh, really uh, help the Ukrainian cause. Um, this was called Art versus War. Uh, second uh, bigger one of ours was Faces of Ukraine, uh, which was really there to show the human side of the suffering of what Russia is doing and give Ukrainians on the ground a voice and really amplify it to EU audiences and and, and abroad widely. Um, and uh, that is it. I think I've more or less used my 10 minutes. So I will conclude here. Happy to pass on the baton and uh, looking forward for the discussion later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sim, for a great presentation. So our next speaker will be uh, Sonka Niedringhaus. So Sonka is a Lieutenant Colonel in the German Army. He has a Master's in Political Science and a PhD in Philosophy, both from Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich. Since 2019, he has been the German Representative and Staff Officer for Education and Training at NATO Center of Excellence for Strategic Communications in Riga, Latvia. He was previously the analyst for the information environment at the Bundeswehr Operational Communication Center in Mayen, Germany. He has also served a six month UN uh, mission uh, for in Mali for the German contingent as comms advisor in 2017 and 2018. And uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dr. Sonka Niedringhaus will give us a perspective of Germany and the NATO view. Yeah. Thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction, Andrew. Um, yeah, uh, good afternoon from uh, Latvia. Great to be here on the panel and thank you for the invitation. So the question that was given uh, to us for this panel was, um, how can the EU engage in the information space in, in times of crisis? 
what I would like to do is first uh, give you some very brief ideas how NATO is concerned with the very same issue. So both organizations, NATO and EU, find themselves in the same environment. That is what military calls information environment. And it is the environment where we have seen over the last several years an escalation of information warfare. And by information warfare, I mean the increased weaponization of information and communications to achieve strategic goals. And historically, that's nothing new in general. Information and information dominance has always been a decisive factor from a military perspective. But the digitalization and, and the new technologies have, have boosted the relevance uh, of information in general. So what NATO did in response to this development is the creation of its own military capability that we call strategic communications. And that is an important point to make here. So NATO as a political military organization conceives of the information space as a military engagement space, first of all. While in general, it is of course much broader than that. So what I wanna do is focus first on the military capability and the roles before going over to a much broader perspective. So to better understand strategic communications as a military capability that we call STRATCOM shortly, um, it can be, can be split up in two major roles. First of all, there's a role for STRATCOM in military operations in particular. Ultimately, it's always the role to achieve the cognitive effect for surrender of the opponent through any kinetic or non-kinetic activities. But of course, the opponent as a main actor is not the only audience uh, you want and need to address for operational success. What you also need is the understanding, the acceptance and support of audiences as home, at home as well as in the area of operations. And that is a lesson NATO painfully learned during Afghanistan where both audiences were lost in the end and none of our strategic goals were achieved. So second role of STRATCOM then is, and that is my, my opinion, the much more important one, um, and that starts long before any military conflict in operation. It's the role to prevent an armed conflict in the first place through credible deterrence, either by denial or punishment. And here the military instrument is only one of many others. So this is where we have to stress the importance of a whole of government approach from a STRATCOM perspective uh, for all political challenges um, in the information space. So whole, whole of government approach would include strong diplomacy, foreign policy, as well as leverage through economic sanctions. That is something where the EU in contrast to NATO has much more options, of course, and where both organizations can more, more or less complement each other with similar strategic interests. So these two roles, role of communications in operations and the role of deterrence are mostly consensus or even common sense. Yet another role is much more controversial and that is the role of how to combat disinformation or information manipulation uh, campaigns in our own societies. So do, do government organizations in general have a legitimate role in assessing, engaging with or influencing own audiences? Here again, it is not necessary or even natural to think of the military organization in the lead for that. It might become reasonable if you think of a disinformation campaign launched by a foreign power as an attack on your own country, your own people and institutions, for example. But disinformation campaigns often start also from within the EU or member nations as well. So I think it, it's not the most imminent question if the military has a role or not in fighting disinformation, but the question what the role of government organizations is overall. And here EU and NATO very much rely first on political public debate and decisions in their member nations. So from my experience, uh, and here I'm talking about Germany, for example, there's a lack of these debates. There's a lack of legitimacy for government organizations and institutions to take action, and therefore the lack of structure and capabilities as a logical consequence. What Germany, for example, has done so far is uh, not implemented STRATCOM nationally, so neither structurally nor conceptually, but we, what we have done is implementation of, for example, law against crime on online platforms. 
this is a necessary instrument to uphold rule of law online against hate speech crime. But this is not the most effective way to counter disinformation in general, if that is what our ultimate goal is here as well. So in, in our liberal democracies, of course, state interference with society, though it is sometimes necessary, is not the fundamental idea. Ideally, the media, professional journalism, or the self-regulatory powers of a free society would be strong enough to counter the threat of disinformation and the harm it brings to society and its members. But arguably, now we have already for some time reached a point where additional instruments should be considered. And we also have reached a point where national structures alone are not sufficient to counter the threats of the information space. The information space nowadays is transnational and its actors and networks are transnational as well. That is something that has become very clear also through the research that we did at our center, for example, about uh, information laundering throughout Europe. Now, the EU has already made a step forward by imposing a legal framework, uh, the Digital um, Services Act for Digital Platforms that we heard already in the first briefing. And we will see how this will affect online disinformation. But as I said, legislation is only one essential aspect to guarantee freedom and equality, but it's only one aspect. Um, and yet disinformation is often connected to hostile um, narratives. It's hard to counter those narratives by means of legislation. In consequence, other aspects, I think, play a significant role here as well. For example, education, media and online literacy, pre-bunking and inoculation against disinformation, for example. This is also a lot of uh, research studies that we did in, in this kind of fields at our center. Another possible or necessary aspect, from my opinion, would be to create or expand the already existing institutions that counteract disinformation and information manipulation. Like, for example, on EU level, it's already mentioned the EU versus disinfo uh, as one example. Another good example from a national uh, level is the Psychological Defense Agency um, that uh, Sweden has created. So their mandate is also to identify and analyze and counter foreign melon information influence activities and other disinformation directed at their national, at their nation and their national interests. So here for the EU, as well as for NATO, it is beneficial to look into the member nations and see what is done there already, what is successful, learn from it and consider also an implementation on the international level. Let me wrap up my part here by saying that information is influence, that that's a truism. If you control the information, if you control the author and the reader, you control everything. So from a purely autocratic perspective, that might be appealing, but not so much from democratic institutions, from a perspective of democratic institutions and societies. Therefore, we should carefully consider every action we take and how it affects our freedom of speech and how it strengthens rather than damages uh, our democracies. With this, I would like to conclude my contribution here. Thanks again for having me on the panel and I'm looking forward to a discussion afterwards. Thank you very much for your presentation of us Leighton and Nidring House. Um, so our next speaker will be Marcus Holmgren uh, so Marcus works at the Finnish Institute of International Affairs, focusing on great power competition over the internet architecture and on questions of digital resilience. So Marcus will be giving a presentation today based on the Finnish perspective. Yes, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, I am not a politician and not a civil servant, so the official uh, Finnish perspective will have to be someone else's responsibility. I will like concentrate more on the bringing the conversation back to the level of the infrastructure, uh, digital infrastructure, digital architecture of how can we maintain uh, the capability of uh, to communicate that uh, if uh, disturbances happen or when disturbances happen so that there is a space uh, and uh, autonomy that we can have discussions and conversations uh, to respond to those 
actions. This is very much uh, Finnish perspective in the sense that uh, we have a broad history of strong resilience uh, work and the preparedness. And uh, this is something that I am certain we will looking forward to improve also in the uh, in the context of NATO with the upcoming membership. And that I'm certain that we will get there uh, eventually, no matter what, uh, how difficult it seems right now. So going back to the uh, actual topic, the digital resilience. I like to divide this uh, area in four different categories, talking about uh, the infrastructure itself, the supply chains uh, that are necessary for maintaining this, uh, this infrastructure. And in, term, in case of digital infrastructure, it's especially important that they uh, function well, because the time for delay, because the need for updates is so urgent. The time for delay is, is not uh, allowed uh, to be very long. So it is very important that the supply chains are, are diverse and the capabilities to uh, strengthen them at the points of need are maintained in, of course, EU level and in uh, national level as well. This uh, includes, of course, then not only the autonomy and coordination between the corporations that do this work, but also the agreements that uh, maintain the operational capability of these different corporations during the time of disturbances. And this is the third dimension here, the governance aspect that and that is the strong suit of EU and where we can focus uh, most. We saw that the, at the uh, COVID pandemic crisis, that there wasn't uh, enough trust between uh, different European societies and uh, border closures, hampered a lot of different uh, co company operations, supply chains, uh, couldn't function properly and many corporations needed to uh, make service cuts, service uh, prioritizations uh, because of they couldn't get their workers where they were needed because there wasn't correct amount of supply, that the supply chains didn't work. And this is something that then uh, hampered the capability to also main, to participate in international communications, which was visible, for example, in uh, acquisition of, of different materials or critical um, healthcare materials. This is, of course, um, not so matter of, of European level discussion. The threat or disturbance didn't influence our capability of, of holding uh, talks very quickly, European uh, key organizations. Uh, adjusted on their working styles so that they could uh, work remotely. But uh, of course, there were a lot of difficulties and there are difficulties still. And this just bring, uh, hamper, hammers down the importance of having these uh, structures prepared, having the systems prepared and having the agreements there so that the governments know uh, what they can do and what they can trust other nations to do so that no country in times of distress uh, becomes to prioritize their own national production uh, at the wrong place at the wrong time so that uh, we would end up in the situation where the com uh, information space would actually diminish uh, European wide because of these disruptions. And here we come back to the fourth uh, point, which is expertise. Expertise, I lived here as separate because of it ties the all three together. It is often the most difficult to, to correct, uh, to repair damaged structures, supply chains, or even agreements uh, that uh, don't have, have been found to not work for one reason or another. If you don't have the expertise, it is much lower to build the expertise uh, if that is lost. And for this reason, it is really crucial that EU uh, focuses on bringing um, innovation to the field of, uh, of information space management of the digital in infrastructure 
Uh, and here, uh, of course, not only talking about internet, but also more uh, traditional ways of communication. But these fields constantly develop so that the when unforeseen circumstances happen, there is ample source of uh, capable um, expertise, capable labor force to respond, to innovate, to find solutions, uh, to solve uh, the issues causing the disturbances, to repair or replace damaged uh, communication networks or server spaces. This is, of course, somewhat different, whether we are talking about malicious disturbances or accidental disturbances. Um, if we are talking about war or natural disasters, for example, it creates a massive difference uh, in the sense of what kind of technologies can be uh, utilized, what kind of solutions are acceptable. For in case of war, as we have seen in Ukraine, remote connections and wireless connections are not um, really an option because they are too easy to target, to detect uh, and target with artillery fire, with other kinds of uh, disturbances. Uh, and of course, also because of uh, in time, in case of any kind of malicious disturbances, there is a heightened uh, need to hide information, to have secure connections. And of course, a traditional way of to do this is to meet up in person, but in modern times, uh, operational time frames are often so uh, short that we cannot uh, expect that to be uh, possibility in many, many occasions, which just uh, creates or uh, highlights the importance for European wide secure connection uh, network of securing the uh, diverse infrastructure and uh, capabilities for maintaining the discussions, uh, maintaining the information space to make uh, these conversations to, to have even the possibility to find a common way to respond uh, into these uh, disturbances. And this is true, whether the disturbance is malicious or uh, accidental or natural. I think my 10 minutes are up from here and I'm looking forward to participating in, in, in conversation and then perhaps continuing with um, this topic and maybe having some interaction between the, uh, this perspective and the more information uh, management uh, side of uh, the issue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcus, for an interesting presentation. Uh, so our next speaker will be Dr. Adrian Venables. Uh, so Dr. Venables served in the UK Royal Navy for 24 years as a communications warfare and intelligence officer. Uh, since leaving the Royal Navy, he has published a series of journal articles and research papers on the cyber threat landscape and its use by state and non-state actors for espionage, sabotage and subversion. Adrian joined uh, Taiwan University of Technology in Estonia as a senior researcher in 2018, specializing in cyber strategy and its role in information and influence operations. He retains his military rank links by serving as a commander in the Royal Navy Reserve, supporting UK cyber resilience activities in the Baltic region. Adrian. Thank you, um, Andrew, thank you. You can um, see the magic of Zoom, even though I'm muted. You can, you can hear, hear me as Andrew and I are sitting next to each other. Um, let me just um, share my screen. There we go, my more magic. Um, okay, so I'm gonna talk about the Estonian perspective of the information environment in times of crisis. And really there is only one, one story here from Estonia and that's uh, what is happening in, uh, in, in Ukraine. Um, now, uh, ironically, um, not missed here, the, uh, the invasion of Ukraine on 24th of February uh, coincided with Estonia's Independence Day. Uh, when statehood was declared in uh, in 1918 from from Russia. Um, now the Estonians are um, are very generous, and with a smile, will say that it is or it has been their their national sport of um, highlighting the Russian threat. And after the after the invasion, there was certainly an, an element of we told you so 
um, but um, without being smug. So there was this element um, within within the media and to the, the wider um, information environment, particularly in Europe, saying, yes, you've criticized us for um, constantly highlighting the Russian threat, but uh, you, you know, um, from our background, we know what we're talking about. And, uh, and of course, uh, geographically and historically speaking, uh, Estonia is very used to being on the front line with Russia and very much engaging in the information environment against Russian propaganda and Russian disinformation. So being very used to this, this sort of environment, um, the Estonian um, government, um, military and um, other organizations very much directed uh, an information campaign to promote um, their narrative. And they did it very much on, on two fronts. Uh, and this is very interesting from an academic perspective and looking at how the narratives differ slightly because uh, es Estonia is very much looking at promoting a particular story narrative to a wider European audience, as well as to, uh, to Russia encountering Russian disinformation and, and Russia's own narrative. Um, an interesting quote, which is sort of doing the rounds here, is that um, we don't fear Russia's strength, only the West's weakness. Now, uh, Estonia, of a, a small country, obviously knows that militarily um, it, it is not comparable to any military threat from Russia, but with NATO and the broader political alliance of, of the EU, there is certainly strength in numbers. And so there's very much this, uh, this emphasis of, of Estonia promoting um, the unity within, within Europe of um, countering um, the, Rus the Russian threat. Uh, and in doing so, it's very interesting to look at um, the different narratives that, in, that have been promoted within, within the EU. Um, there's a very uncompromising um, story um, being, being promoted here within Estonia and also indeed from the other Baltic states of Russia must be defeated. Um, there must be a, um, a, an uncompromising view of um, uh, one aim of, of the, the Russian threat must be mitigated both politically and, and military. And certainly from uh, the Baltic states, historical examples are used and that there's a whole, a whole ream of um, uh, Russian um, active measures which have been used in, uh, in Estonia and uh, broader in the former Soviet states. And these are being used to promote the, uh, um, the methods to counter the current threats. Um, the Estonian Prime Minister has um, gained plaudits within, um, within EU, EU and uh, um, broader globally. She's been very active in engaging this media campaign within the European um, environment to promote um, Estonia's narrative and, um, and this element of an uncompromising uh, defeat of, of, of Russia. Um, She's also warned that um, there will be pain of, of sanctions and the, uh, the EU um, and, and wider global sanctions against Russia will obviously have an effect upon, um, upon Europe and there will be pain, but this pain is, is worth it. And um, trying to promote the, the European um, solidarity, there have been some criticism of France and Germany in particular, this element of Russia must be given an escape plan, uh, Russia mustn't be humiliated, and there's got to be a way out for Putin. And there has been some criticism of that within the, the information environment within, within Estonia and, and the Baltic states. And it has been very interesting to see how this, this crisis element has been, uh, has been countered within, within the EU and the focus from, from the Baltic aspect. Uh, Estonia was one of the first EU countries to label um, uh, Russia's actions in Ukraine as, as genocide. Um, that's a very strong word, um, but certainly um, Estonia has not uh, um, retreated from that and has been very strong in promoting it. Um, Estonia has also been uh, very prominent in the information environment of um, calling for Ukraine to be a, 
uh, a strong candidate for uh, future EU membership. And uh, this is something which um, certainly is, is very active in the European Parliament and EU Commission at, at the moment. Uh, and indeed, um, Estonia, along with the other Baltic states, um, Poland, and indeed states which haven't had this historical link to, uh, to Russian aggression, um, calling for U Ukraine to be a, a prominent, prominent member um, of uh, um, the EU in, in the future. And that's been, that's been very interesting. Um, Estonia has also promoted that uh, the EU has a moral duty um, that um, Ukraine needs to be uh, be part of, of, of the EU, and that's been very prominent within the information environment here. Now, looking at uh, uh, away from Europe and looking at countering um, the Russian propaganda, the Russians' uh, narrative, um, Estonia was very quick um, the day after the uh, the invasion to ban from broadcasting um, a number of Russian and Belarusian TV channels in, in, in Estonia. Um, these, uh, these broadcasts, as well as um, free-to-air broadcasts, which obviously from Russia only has limited um, coverage in Estonia, a lot of it is, is online. And so um, it, Estonia has banned the, uh, um, the, the nations which, or the, the stations which I've, I've listed there. Um, <clears throat> obviously with a uh, strong Russian speaking population, and Estonian TV actually has its own Russian language channel, which is uh, focused on the, uh, the ethnic Russian minority for whom Russian is the, uh, um, the native tongue. And, and many of the, the ethnic Russians here don't speak Estonian um, particularly well or, or at all. So having a state broadcaster broadcasting in Russian um, gives a very strong message both to uh, ethnic Russians here, but also to, um, to Russians in Russia and, um, and uh, native Russians around, around the world, promoting a, a certain uh, narrative from, from this part of the world. And the Estonian tech uh, regulator uh, in the beginning of March uh, blocked access to a number of, of Russian websites, which are, are, I've listed, listed there. Um, that may appear to be um, significant. Um, however, a little bit of uh, research indicated that these sites can actually be uh, easily accessed Via, via VPN, so um, it has limited um, real world um, implications and, and practical sort of censorship of the Russian narrative, but still promotes that message that um, we are doing all that we can to limit the uh, um, Russian propaganda and the Russian message into the Baltic states and um, trying to direct people to, um, to the more European focus of, of, of events that are going on. Now, for those who are not uh, familiar with the Baltic states, um, a little bit of uh, background. Um, Estonia, a very small country, um, 1.3 million only. I mean, there's uh, um, six, seven million in, in London. So it is very small. And, and the Estonians actually have been very, um, very quick to point out that um, uh, Russia uh, within Ukraine have deported out of Ukraine into Russia um, more Ukrainians than the entire population of, of Estonia to put into context of both what is happening in Ukraine, but also the size of, of the Estonian population. So 300,000 of these uh, 1.3 million um, uh, Estonians um, are native, native Russian speakers. Um, they have um, strong cultural and ethnic um, and indeed family relations to, to Russia. And, and there is this, um, common scenario within Russia that it will attack other countries in order to protect its uh, diaspora. And this was one of the reasons why Russia invaded initially in, in East, Eastern Ukraine. And so there's obviously that, uh, um, uh, that very careful promotion of the, um, uh, of the Estonian um, narrative and, and the Estonian philosophy to, um, to make sure that we're not seen as being uh, attacking of this uh, ethnic, uh, ethnic Russian uh, minority. So range of media channels is used to promote um, the, the, um, the Baltic, Baltic narrative and, and using media channels, including, um, as I said, the, the Russian TV channel. Um, this also counters um, some Facebook that I've quoted there of um, some very pro-Russian pro uh, uh, narratives there. 
Um, as, as I come to come to an end here, as Andrew's telling me to come to an end, um, there is a um, uh, indications that actually the, these effects are having ha, um, are being successful, and that uh, Russian-speaking Estonians are increasingly turning to uh, to Estonian Estonian media. And uh, we've also uh, also seen some um, uh, uh, eviction um, or. Ed, uh, expelled Russian diplomats from uh, from Estonia as well, reducing the the Russian narrative that has been uh, um, been promoted and uh, um, uh, that less lessening of um, Russian influence in um, in Estonia. Um, um, I think I've mentioned much of this. The uh, the Estonian um, or the ethnic Russians um, minority is primarily in the east of the country. And, um, and certainly we've seen a reduction in the effectiveness of the Russian uh, propaganda, um, particularly directing the older population who generally have been more, more pro-Putin. Pro um, what has been, has been interesting is also we've seen um, Estonian population have been quite effective in countering um, Russian information campaigns. Um, Dominika may recognize the language, but certainly the F the Estonians within social media have been very good in looking for where there's been disinformation and have been and have been countering this and uh, and certainly social media has been very active in this environment. Just in the yeah. So just to conclude here, um, so um, historically, information campaign, um, uh, information crisis has been um, uh, prominent here, and we are very used to dealing with it. Uh, Estonia is fighting on two fronts, uh, Estonian and uh, European and, and Russia, and certainly we've seen some successes in, in, in this campaign. And I will now finish, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Commander Venable. So our next speaker will be uh, Dominika Helena Agantas. Uh, Dominika is a security incident response analyst for Eurofins, and she recently attained her master's degree um, related to her talk today. Uh, so yeah, um, Dominika, the floor is yours. Thank you for this introduction. Let me... Uh, we can't hear you, Dominika. Oh, no? Can you hear me now? No. Ooh. Okay. I can. No. Okay, so some people hear me and some not. Oh, okay. Okay, um, just so you know, Andrew, I don't hear you. Yes, you're all good, my, my apologies. Okay, cool. Um, let, me, let me share my screen. Okay. All good? Yes, please continue. Okay. So carrying the torch of the previous conversations, uh, now the discussion will be moved to the cases of Greece and Poland. I have lived in both countries. I'm constantly traveling to Greece and currently I'm living in Poland. So the press, social media and societies of both countries are familiar to me. The main focus is put upon the latest developments in Ukraine and how this issue is perceived in Greece compared to Poland. So let's start with uh, Greece and the approach of its government. The Greek government condemns Vladimir Putin's attack on Ukraine, specifically right after the attack. Mitsotakis, the prime minister of Greece, clearly stated that Greece stands by the side of Ukraine. And this was also expressed with the sending uh, humanitarian aid, military supplies, reception of thousands of refugees from Ukraine, and also supporting Ukraine's EU membership. At this point, I would like to highlight that Greece is opposed to the fast track solution when it comes to Ukraine joining European Union. Its position is basically that all procedures which are provided in the Article 49 of the European Union Treaty should be followed. Athens places a priority on the Western Balkan succession process, which must be sustained and accelerated. It also insists on the region's uh, European perspective being a top priority. And 
Also, many of the Balkan countries have already taken significant steps towards their admission, like implementing necessary reforms and satisfying several commitments for their EU membership. Now, the Greek society is divided. Uh, a mid-March survey, which was conducted by Politico, showed that 60% of Greeks found Russians' invasion uh, in Ukraine unacceptable, compared to actually 88%, 86%, 82%, and 78% in Netherlands, Spain, Germany, and France, respectively. So many Greeks sympathize with Russia first and foremost because of their shared Orthodox faith. The Russians for centuries have been presenting themselves as the protectors of the Orthodox Christians during the Ottoman Empire. So the myth of the great savior in the East is strongly anchored in the Greek culture. Many people with uh, right-wing convictions, which are also members of the conservative party, still believe that for some magical reason, the Russians are going to take Istanbul, which was firmly the Orthodox stronghold for Constantin of Constantinople, liberate it and give it to Greece, fulfilling the dream of a new Byzantine empire. Many Greeks seem to fear that supporting sanctions and boycotting Russian goods could hurt Greece. Prices for certain products, including electricity and gas, have risen sharply in Greece, so it's expected that most people fear that those measures against Moscow will have an impact on their economic situation. What is more, 39% of Greeks support that Ukraine should not be submitted an EU membership at all. 38% of them feel that Greece is not put into danger due to the Ukrainian war. And also they refer to the imperialistic nature of the EU as it joined the NATO forces in Yugoslavia, Afghanistan, Syria, and Libya. What I'm trying to say here is that the percentages of people who are not going against, who are not opposed to Russians' military actions in Ukraine are just significantly higher compared to other EU countries. Moving on, I have included some images uh, taken during the first day of the invasion in Ukraine. So there are definitely parts of Greek society will, which stand by the side of Ukraine. But at the same time, there are people like this on these images where you see demonstrations supporting Putin, Russia, and the Orthodox spirit. Such expressions are not really common in other European countries. By checking the Greek press, uh, I can say that it mostly uses the term war in Ukraine. It also seems to be divided with no clear expression of solidarity uh, for Ukraine. It mostly correlates all development that happened in Ukraine to those in Cyprus and Turkey. It blames United States, EU and NATO for provoking Putin. It does not cover the contributions of the local Greek communities uh, which support Ukrainians and also does not really remind people that the war is still ongoing. And finally, it does not actively report on the newest developments. Finally, I found some interesting tweets of Greek politicians referring to the attack on Ukraine. So as you can see on the slide, uh, Mr. Marcus said Putin will be remembered and go down in history as a great and worthy leader. Another tweet says, bravo, chase them all the way to Germany like before. Zelensky is begging Europe and NATO to get involved. He's trying to start World War III. Pray that he shuts up. And finally, may God protect President Putin and all the Russians fighting for freedom. So we got a taste how Greece deals with the attack in Ukraine, and now let's see how Poland manages this issue. Poland has been one of the Ukraine's most vocal allies since the beginning of the war. Warsaw has repeatedly called on the EU to impose harsher sanctions on Russia, and also has moved to introduce some of its own ahead of um, other European partners. And it also has committed itself to uh, ending all Russian energy imports this year. Uh, generally, Poland has established itself also as the main conduit of weapons and aid from West to Ukraine. The Polish government has supported Ukraine's ambitions to join the EU with the so-called fast track. Uh, Prime Minister of Poland, Mateusz Morawiecki, and his Czech and Slovenian counterparts became the first foreign leaders to visit Kiev since Russian invasion. And Warsaw has also pushed for a tough military response to Moscow's aggression. It has provided equipment to Ukraine. It sought to strengthen NATO's presence on the Eastern flank and also passed a law boosting the defense of Poland to the defense spending to 3% of GDPR. 
Uh, since Russia launched its war, uh, Poland has also been at the front line of uh, providing support to Ukraine, as it has received around 4 million of refugees for now, which is far more than any country. Also, Polish society uh, and politicians have largely welcomed those fleeing Ukraine. So alongside public support uh, expressed with free public transport, Polish ID numbers and help for families that host Ukrainians, there has been a massive support from society in the form of everyday activism. So Polish retailers and consumers uh, have joined this effort. They remove Russian and Belarusian products from their shelves and their baskets in a display of solidarity with Ukraine. Uh, firms which continue to do business in Russia, they are added in the cold list of shame in Poland, which results in protests and consumer boycotts. Um, restaurants and shops around Poland have changed the names of the Russian dumplings, which is one of the country's most popular and traditional dishes to Ukrainian, which also is uh, an expression of solidarity with the Eastern neighbor. Um, as for the society, Polish society has a clear a united stance towards the war in Ukraine. This is confirmed by polls conducted within a period of February uh, till March. Specifically, 84% of Polish responders support taking refugees from Ukraine. 70% believe that their government should add even more sanctions on the Russian government. The main feelings uh, associated with the war is fear and sadness. And this fear comes from the fact that the events in Ukraine endanger the security of Poland. 80% believe that uh, a full embargo on Russian crude oils and gas should be, should be put, despite the fact that uh, this will lead to even higher prices of goods. 47% uh, describe NATO's actions as too cautious. 68% believe that NATO should give Ukraine also offensive weapons. And finally, only 90% of people support that Poland should continue the diplomatic ties to Russia. These images uh, show all above I mentioned, taken from all around Poland. Uh, the first image on the top is actually the city I live. So from the first day of the invasion till actually even yesterday, the lights on this uh, monument have not changed. Pressing Poland, it delineates the human aspect of war, shows the pain and atrocities. The phrases that are co most commonly used are not war in Ukraine, but invasion, genocide, attack, occupation, and war crimes. It criticizes uh, European Union for playing it safe and actually asks for more. It reminds Poles that the war has not ended, uh, it reminds them to support Ukraine and provide uh, numerous ways and information on how to do this. And finally, it gives precise and immediate coverage of the events in Ukraine. So all in all, this short, short presentation showed that war in Ukraine was an exogenous shock, which accentuated divergences among the EU countries. It also brought uh, new lines of political division, depending also on the uh, country's energy mix and degree of dependence on Russia. Divisions are also seen within the societies based on their religious and political beliefs. What is remarkable in the case of Poland is that whole nation and government stand united and focus on the human aspect and suffering of the Ukrainians, despite the controversies and turbulences in Polish-Ukrainian uh, relations of the past. That's, that's all for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very, uh, very much, Dominika, for a really interesting presentation. Uh, so now we'll move into the panel uh, panel discussion component of today's uh, today's seminar, and we've got uh, thankfully quite a few questions. Um, so I'll start off uh, with a question raised by Sian Fitzgerald, a security and defense researcher from IIEA. So Russian military doctrine indicates that all other forms of military activity in the conflict space are subordinate to an information campaign. Since civilians and civilian means of information dissemination are now the primary target of Russian operations, would this likely mean that a whole of government approach is only a partial defense and that we should instead be looking at focusing on a whole of society approach to defend against hostile activity in the information space? 
So I thought perhaps the best uh, way to start this off would be um, perhaps uh, Seem if you could have a response to it um, as it kind of fits in nicely with um, the kind of research you're doing around the development of a FIMI toolbox and developing these kind of uh, counter disinformation tools uh, to involve all of society and not just a government approach. Yes, yeah, sure. And uh, thanks for the great question. Um, a very short answer to this would be yes, and I will be done with my uh, uh, response. I will add just a bit more detail. Um, why I say yes is that first, uh, all levels, as I said, all levels of the society are targeted. If we're talking about um, a kind of an information being used as a weapon, as a part of a wider uh, kind of uh, military arsenal, then, then absolutely first, we're all victims, hence, we all need to be kind of factoring into uh, our work against uh, this type of activity. Second, we all have different types of roles to play. Um, there are steps that the governments can can do and, and are, are doing. There are steps that uh, journalists can take. Uh, they have a special role in, in democratic societies uh, as, uh, as uh, the, the guardians um, of a civil society, again, a different role, our education system, so on and so forth. So as we all can contribute to our kind of collective response and our collective resilience, again, another reason for involving the whole society. And, and uh, my last thought here is that um, even if we kind of move from a very a strict uh, military um, application of information manipulation towards the wider problem of of disinformation and and misinformation and malinformation then again we kind of can use uh, many of the same responses uh, to tackle these types of a bit more softer maybe um, um, sides of information manipulation because uh, to an extent to a very large extent uh, the responses um, and steps to build resilience to information manipulation be it in a military context or a non-military context are the same so uh, again just to reiterate the answer is a very strong yes Thank you. I might uh, try to get uh, Obos Leutnant uh, Niederinghaus uh, on this topic because uh, you talked about in your um, presentation ensuring that the policies and uh, uh, the kind of focus was on this whole of society approach. So how to engage the whole of society and not just a government approach. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. I think that it's a very, very good and very uh, interesting uh, basic question. So what I want to try to focus first on was that uh, when we talk about military conflict, uh, military crisis, uh, then it's it's never only just the military. So that's first of all what I wanted to focus. It's never only the military branch of government, but it's always a whole uh, of government uh, responsibility. But it doesn't end there. The government, of course. Um, so the the traditional instruments of power for government are diplomacy, information, military, and economy. But um, as the question like already like uh, shows us that that's not enough to 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 secure our information space. So, so we need more than that. And I already also mentioned briefly that uh, in terms of education, we need to be better. Um, in terms of um, uh, NGOs, maybe that, that, that can help with that society activities, uh, groups, unions, um, also startup companies. There are a lot of new startup companies uh, that are combating uh, disinformation, um, pro providing to their customers information security. So, um, it's, it's much more than only government. And to be honest, government is, is also not the best <laughs> in doing this kind of things. So out of society, there are much more uh, new um, yeah, evol evolving um, ideas, techniques, and also structures that, that can help us to, to counter these uh, uh, information, uh, yeah, hostile information activities. And that's a good thing about, uh, I mean, about free democracy. So we have these, these kind of uh, uh, um, grassroots uh, movements and also like uh, companies that are evol evolving out of the necessity for a democratic society to, to protect itself, apart from the government that also has, of course, the role, uh, de definitely. Thank you very much. Um, as we have a million and one questions coming through, I might uh, give you ones that are kind of targeted on your presentations um, to make it uh, 
so we get through a, as much content as possible. So I was wondering, um, uh, Marcus, you gave your presentation on, on the kind of digital infrastructure and the, the importance in, in terms of uh, information management. Um, this is about a two hour uh, question, which could have its own couple of PhDs. Uh, but what do you see as potentially the role of um, you know, emerging technologies like artificial intelligence to manage the information space, as well as to do things such as you know, the generation of disinformation, as well as the detection of disinformation? Yes, um, thank you, Andrew. Really simple and easy question. But I think the, here I also I could, I could just answer yes because the, the, the role of, of IE, of, of machine learning on these like loads of different uh, technologies are going to be massive. And uh, for whether they are massive for better or for worse, of course, depends uh, much of the capabilities that, that we have and those uh, featuring so like causing the disturbances uh, have. So here again, of course, the difference between uh, malicious uh, disturbances, war and the like, and the natural disturbances is, is huge because in case of war, we, are, we enter into this kind of uh, armament uh, competition of uh, between the dis disruption and uh, attacking and spying capabilities, and then the resilience uh, preparation uh, and deterrence capabilities on the other side. And this uh, dynamic, of course, co is completely lacking in the case of natural disasters or pandemic crisis uh, or the like. This is, um, in, in this kind of case, of course, the emerging technologies like, like the five, actual 5G when we, when we eventually end there and the spread of this uh, connection options is going to be of uh, immense help. And I believe that also artificial intelligence will solely be uh, of possible posit positive development uh, in this, uh, this phase uh, or this side of the issue, because of it can help us uh, detect uh, the delays, detect where the problem actually is, such as uh, solutions. And as, as this capability spread, is, it is really a general purpose technology that will spread everywhere. And it is only in the malicious side uh, of the issue that we will uh, end uh, with a lot of uh, new um, threats, a lot of new kinds of disturbances that we have to be prepared of. And uh, if, just to finish up, I think the most important thing that EU could do here uh, to prepare for this, these changes that the emerging technologies are going to bring is to uh, speed up the standard unification of standardization process. Uh, currently, the single market uh, for high uh, tech solutions doesn't entirely cover, uh, like, reach the single market. It is not really uh, there yet because of, in many cases, like um, a med tech and, and even uh, platform algorithms, a lot of the corporations have to uh, have the standardizations and orders for different member states uh, individually, which, which makes, uh, which breaks up the single market and it gives a huge competitive advantage of the larger single markets that, that have, in the sense that those single markets that have single audit system. So unification of this would be of immense help of, de uh, of developing the know-how, the innovation and the strong co uh, corporations, private companies uh, that we are going to need uh, for maintaining the strategic autonomy uh, in case of uh, disturbances. Thank you. Thank you for succinctly answering such a big topic for me. Um, so I'll, I'll jump around a bit purely because we got so many questions. So the next one I'll address to Dr. Venable. So as uh, the information space is now becoming increasingly militarized and instrumentalized by the Russian Federation, is there now a necessity for countries like Ireland to prioritize replicating dedicated information warfare assets in its military of the kind of the British Army's 77th Brigade? Yeah, uh, thank you. I mean, 77th Brigade is a military organization that is, is focused at a operational and tactical level um, in, a, in a military environment. 
Um, what we're looking at here is very much strategic and strategic communications. Um, and so it's very much more of a government level aspect. So information warfare units in the military are certainly important and, and have a place. But I think what we're looking at here where it's um, at, at a higher level, um, we're looking at, at a whole of government, a whole of society level of um, making sure that um, both um, a, a country and a society fully understands what's going on and is able to both um, recognize and counter um, propaganda and disinformation from an, from an adversary um, without having to constantly feed them a case of this is right, this is wrong. What we ideally want is for um, populations as a, as a whole to be much more questioning of what they see and to be able to make to make their own decisions. So I think what we're emphasizing here is that the, the invasion of Ukraine um, with the problems of social media in this campaign, um, it's highlighted the importance of the information environment. It's highlighted the fact that everybody, um, military, government, civilians, military population, we are all information warriors. We are all part of this and we all have a role to play in being able to discuss, recognize and counter disinformation where we see it. Thank you. Uh, I might also pass this question on to Abbas Leutnant Niedringhaus, uh, who also, I think, commented in this presentation about the development of specific capabilities in Sweden and Germany in relation to um, you know, countering disinformation. Uh, so to the question, is it necessary for a country such as Ireland to develop a specific military capability um, in, this, in this regard? Um, that's a good question. I would say it's, it's not it would be good to have a bit ability definitely but doesn't need to be a military one that was like the bottom line also of my presentation so 77th brigade as uh, um, dr venable said is, is a military capability of uh, united kingdom um, we have similar military capabilities in germany for specifically operational purposes on the operational tactical level in a uh, um, nato operation for example or an eu mission um, uh, but this, this is very much focused then on the operational environment and to gain an information dominance uh, for, for a certain mission, for a certain um, yeah, operating environment. So the very good question is, and that's also a question I, I rose, so these, these units that are there um, for uh, conflict, um, for operations, what, what, what could be their role also uh, uh, in peacetime or in, in a time that is considered a hybrid uh, conflict situation? So is there a role for them also um, work uh, towards their nation and towards their national security during during these times um, or is there not um, so that that would be a question for the military capabilities in particular um, what i mentioned with sweden uh, for example was that they have a, a psychological defense agency and that that's not a military uh, uh, institution so they have this under the uh, ministry of, um, of um, justice so they specifically considered this a civilian institution therefore and um, but it also has the task for um, uh, securing uh, their society, their nation from hostile information influence campaigns. This is something that could also, of course, be done by a military uh, unit as the 77th Brigade, or they can support, could support this. Uh, but this is what I meant with uh, lack of political debate and uh, legitimization uh, done on the political level and on society level and public level. Uh, with regards to what 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 can be the role, what is the legitimate role also of military units, uh, first of all, and then also of course of government uh, in general uh, in interfering in the, in the information space. From my perspective, yeah, there's a role. Um, there should be a role. Um, the threat is clear. I mean, we all see it. Threat. It was presented to you through several uh, presentations today also. So um, we just have to figure this out. What what is the best uh, way? What is the best balance? And I think the balance was also one of the other questions. So what is the best balance to counter this, uh, um, this hostile aggressions in the information space? Thank you. Um, so I might uh, doctor this question just a bit um, and ask this uh, to Dominika. Um, so in the kind of course of your study about the Polish and um, Greek kind of information environment, um, what do you think the rest of uh, Europe can learn um, from the experience of uh, Greece and Poland 
and countering uh, Russian disinformation and influence campaigns. Sorry, thank you for this question. So the thing that other European countries can learn, especially for Polish people, is basically to stay united, uni united and think about more, uh, there is a strategic part behind the war, but also think about uh, the fact that uh, here we are, we have lots of refugees, there is an ongoing crisis. And despite the fact that Poland is actually uh, geographically really close to Ukraine, uh, still, it's like a domino. Um, when one state fails, the other states will fail as well because it's a whole a network, all the European Union, it's like all countries together. So that's that's the thing that uh, other countries should learn from Poland. Now, when it comes to Greece, there is definitely, uh, it's really important to have a proper um, filtering of information and cross-checking uh, the information that is available from different sources, uh, because that's the only way, but being aware, it's the only way to actually understand what type of information is propaganda, is a threat or not. Uh, this is not implemented uh, highly in Greece. That's why there is so much confusion and division within the society and press. But in Poland, it's it's it, they just focused on uh, on the aspect of of the human factor. That's why they do not get so deeply into the propaganda that is spread by the by the Russian government. Thank you. Um, so I might open this question up for everyone because I've got uh, quite a few questions of a different uh, variety related to it. And then basically, um, there's been bans on these Russian uh, news outlets, whether that be RT, Sputnik, as such. Um, and the question goes to the values of um, the EU as a society, as one that's you know democratic and, and open and where there's freedom of expression. How do we ensure that um, you know uh, we we can enact things like uh, banning um, these uh, uh, media outlets um, whilst also retaining you know our fundamental sense of you know freedoms and, and liberties? And is there any conflicts in, in these actions? So I thought I might start with Sim, and then we can go across, and everyone can have a, a viewpoint about this. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I would divide this into kind of two uh, sets of answers very quickly. First, is we should look at um, media environment. And secondly, everything to do with uh, social media. Uh, when it comes to media, then there are a couple of things there. First, I think there should be a clearer understanding of what is journalism. Um, because not, you know, these days, everyone can really call themselves a journalist and then really uh, want the kind of benefits that come with that, uh, be it source protection, be it something else. Um, while as there are internationally recognized uh, voluntary professional standards, ethical standards for journalism that journalists themselves have put down. Now, if you have an outlet like Sputnik or RT who don't really follow nearly any of the self-regulatory elements or aspects and quite the opposite they have over the past years they have openly stated that they are rather to be seen as a part of uh, their country's uh, defensive capabilities then my question is why are we so adamant at uh, trying to frame them as journalism uh, that is the first thing if we discuss whether banning or sanctioning rt and sputnik is limiting the medium of freedom of media we have already lost in the sense that we are really dancing to their uh, to their rhythm and their tune so we should really draw a line between journalism that needs extra attention and extra protection and then everything else Sputnik and RT fall very much into everything else category so I think what the EU has done at the moment that has a very limited time frame and is a direct reaction to Russia's war in Ukraine is is legally sound and and morally even more so uh, the second part is everything to do with social media platforms and there as well the EU's approach has been to not look so much at what uh, you know, as a specific or individual pieces of content, it's something 
you know, factually correct or not, if we take the Digital Services Act and the code of practice that kind of goes hand in hand with it to an extent, I would say uh, the focus is very much on more transparency by the platforms that are at the moment still very much black boxes, uh, some more, some even more so, uh, none of them are really open. Um, and uh, secondly, it's about empowering, uh, empowering users, uh, giving them more kind of tools to maybe opt out from algorithmic uh, editorial design, et cetera, et cetera. And last point here is, uh, um, as we don't really know, a previous speaker mentioned emerging threats, we can't really foresee the emerging threats. Yes, we can uh, conduct studies, analy ana analysis, all of that, but we really have to be flexible. So the DSA uh, introduces something called systemic risks, and, and this is what the platforms are going to have to assess, and those risks can change. And we're here talking mainly about kind of, yeah, systemic risks in the sense that uh, what are the kind of design flaws, if you will, of different platforms that enable uh, malicious actors to use those uh, weak points or design flaws to push mis and disinformation. Um, there's much more to, to be said about this, but uh, I'm going to hand over the baton to the other speakers. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so perhaps, Marcus, you could give us your thoughts on this topic. Yes, thank you. Just very briefly, I have a one and a half points. Uh, the, the point one is that uh, the common rules, common clearly written shared rules are very important here because that uh, creates the impartiality. It's, it's the rule of law ap approach. Democracies function as long as we have uh, the shared rules and not, and not everything is up to debate. And then the uh, half part of first part is that uh, these rules need to be then uh, not technological uh, oriented. They have to be something that that allow, allow ruling or rulings over the situations, no matter what technologies were used uh, in the course of uh, for for this disinformation campaign uh, purposes. And here, restraint is also uh, very important. We are talking about enforcement of rules, not engaging uh, in a similar manner. We too have a high, great capability of, of creating this information, of creating very efficient bots, for example, in Twitter or other platforms to, to promote uh, freedom, um, pro, pro human rights information, but we shouldn't do that. Uh, that is engaging in a, in a whole diff, uh, wrong way and accelerating the problem in this kind of arms race situation that I talked about uh, earlier. Instead, just a sticking down uh, of enforcing the rules that are clearly written uh, and getting better at enforcing them. Thank you. Uh, Songo, would you like to say something about this? Um, yeah, thank you. Oh, just very briefly, so with regards to media and should we allow uh, Russian media to operate in the EU? Uh, I mean, no country is like obliged to let a, a, a foreign country's uh, state-run propaganda outlet to operate on their own soil. So I don't think that's, that's a legal problem. Uh, it's more like, I think it's more like a technical problem because you can, as I said, operate on your own soil but uh, how do you really like prevent them to operate? I mean, over the internet, you can access them from everywhere. So they can easily escape these, these kind of uh, bans. Uh, of course, they would love to have their stations also running in Berlin and uh, broadcast from there, from their studios. So they don't have this opportunity now, but uh, nonetheless, as I, that also comes back to what I said, I think the legal um, aspect of, of combating disinformation is, is one aspect, but it's, it's not the, uh, the, the only one. Uh, and not the most important one. It's, it's more like really taking taking proactive actions. So banning, yes, I think it's possible and it's also legitimate to ban these kind of non-media outlets. Um, but it, it's uh, it's only one uh, one tick in the box. I would say. Thank you, Adrian. Yeah. Just... Yeah. Yeah, just one, uh, just one point to add that. that. I think that's um, really key. Yeah. In, in a rules-based international order, um, here in the West, we have certain rules of the media, how they're governed, impartiality. We have to understand that our adversaries don't operate to those those same rules, 
And so any criticism of um, uh, stifling, muting Russian media is seen as a um, infringement of you know, freedom of information and debate. We need to understand that they are operating to different rules and that what are overtly um, or propaganda mechanisms um, need to be defeated. So we don't all play to the same rules and we have to adjust to that. Thank you. And I'll give the last comment to Dominica about this topic of, um, you know, values and, uh, you know, uh, banning, oh, as we say, we're not, not exactly media outlets, but uh, maybe other nation states uh, operations. So what Poland actually gave, uh, it's, it's his response uh, to, to the propaganda of Russia is basically uh, approach all the important media outlets, social media companies uh, to block the, the Russian presence online. And what started to create was alternative means of uh, communication and uh, information in Russian language, which were filtered out and definitely were kind of more, uh, where let's say we're not coming from the mainstream and from the, from the outlets in Russia. So this is one, one approach that I saw to, to the topic of how to uh, balance this, uh, from one side the freedom of speech and from the other sides you have some control over it uh well in in poland it's actually effective uh in most cases i have seen that many countries have blocked uh russian uh russian content in their in their platforms but um the second approach the fact that you still allow kind of uh, content from russia related to russia it's something that many countries could think about how to balance these things out. So I think we, uh, we've come to an end uh, today of our seminar. Um, so I'd like to thank all of our panelists um, for your presentations and for your uh, interesting views and opinions. Uh, it's been excellent. I'd like to thank uh, Andrew Gilmore and the IIEA um, for organizing uh, this seminar and um, the interesting uh, debate that we've had today. And I'd also like to thank the uh, audience and attendees for um, attending. And I think uh, if you want to have, you know, further information based on um, the discussion we've had today, I'm sure there's some great content and research on uh, IIEA's website, um, as well as the East Stratcom task force and uh, some of the interesting tools they have, like uh, the EU versus Disinfo uh, Twitter site, which is uh, always good fun. And also uh, the great research, which comes out of um, the NATO Stratcom um, and uh, also interesting research from the Finnish Institute of International Affairs. So I'd like to thank you uh, for your time today and um, wish you the best. Thank you very much. Thank you.